up and running. So people, my people, this is interview number two. We are getting interview number one, but I've got two with this guy. Let's save the first save of the fame. So Rod, the big question: Why whiskey? Uh, I'm glad you asked, Hodan. I mean, I like many people started my journey with wine and beer, I suppose. And for many years, I was the managing partner of a mid-sized law firm in Sydney, where one always ended up at a restaurant with a a bottle of wine being ordered. So, I certainly had a a long experience of being educated so far as palate is concerned. And it so turned out that one of the founding partners of that law firm established his own winery uh, in Bacolban in in the Hunter Valley some years ago. So uh, we would always be drinking the very best wine. Um, And I think that gave me a palate generally and an appreciation of quality uh, alcohol. But then um, a friend of mine, Tim, who is a Scotsman, introduced me to whiskey and it was a fairly fateful thing for him to do and he we laugh about it these days because he he, he sort of almost apologizes that he did so because he cre- he's created a whiskey monster uh in rod um so we we were uh we were good mates we'd get together once a month just to catch up and talk about life we both had young children he had four kids i had three uh busy busy professional lives and being able to share a dram together was a lovely thing um, and I developed the habit of buying a new bottle each month to bring to this um, this monthly gathering. And then we ended up convincing some other male friends to join us for this monthly gathering. And we named it the Inklings after a group that used to meet with J.R. Tolkien uh, and his friends, uh, C.S. Lewis and others. And they, the Inklings group, they would meet at a pub. They're all uh, distinguished authors Mm. And they would meet in a pub, they'd smoke their pipes and drink a lot of beer and talk about um, the deeper things of life. And so we all bought pipes. Uh, at one stage, I was collecting pipes as well. And uh, we would we would have some whiskey and smoke our pipes and, and talk about life. And it was very wonderful. Um, and I started then incorporating whiskey appreciation into my business activities. So... Uh, I would often put together business networking events for my business clients at the law firm and we would build these events around a whiskey tasting, which I would host, of course. Um, I became involved in the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society, which is a global network of people who love cask strength, single cask whiskey, um, and that really uh, increased my understanding and appreciation of whiskey. I then I started attending every whiskey session every whiskey tasting that i could get involved with um they were, a lot of them were run at the oak barrel in sydney and uh, we would have guest speakers from distilleries from scotland in particular but also from other places around the world um, and i was one of these people that was meticulous with making notes uh of everything i tasted and i had a i had an app on my phone which um stopped working some years ago and i was very regretful about that because i had so much data on it but i must have composed notes dissecting over 2000 different whiskies over the years and um, the format of the app required me to put in data around the nose the taste the finish the balance um and anything unique about uh, each expression and so it really got to a point where you could you could blind test me on any whiskey and I, I would probably be able to tell you what it was. Such was the detail of the notes that I took. So I think I just had this self-imposed intensity about getting to know uh, whiskey. I also travelled, of course, I went to Scotland and visited distilleries there. I got to know distillers around Australia. I spent some time in Tasmania. Uh, I've, I've done a course with the International Brewers and Distillers to learn about some of the science behind uh, about, uh, behind it and obviously learned a lot of things from talking with other distillers. But I think it's been um, a journey of about 20 years. Um, I, I read a lot of books. Um, so I've got a, a large library of books, not only about whiskey, but about other forms of spirits, uh, wine, etc. cetera. Um, I've <clears> traveled <throat> to Bordeaux, to Cognac, to Jerez de la Frontera in Spain, Saturn, all these places to learn about some of the great traditions of, um, you know, producing some of the finest alcohol on planet Earth. And um, I, I just bring that passion to to making my own whiskey. So, you know, when we started making our first batch, 
I remember standing at the still as we're collecting the first lot of heads. Uh, it, it changes, the chemical composition changes as, as the mm. still runs and the changing as well. It's a little bit like a spectrum of flavours and there am I every two or three minutes, you know, trying to uh, interrogate this spirit to identify all of the flavours and 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 uh, characteristics of the spirit as it's running off the still. Um, so the, it's like it's like you know the notes that one might take at the back of a courtroom, you know, ten or fifteen pages of notes for my first run, and it, I think it just reflects that intensity of interest and curiosity that I have. So. so I think it's just inevitable if you have that degree of interest and passion for anything that over time you will develop quite a deep understanding and knowledge of it. And I think, um, you know, once we started making the whiskey, which was six years ago, um, I think it's then um, having then deeper conversations with other distillers. Um, I think some people, once they get into the industry and they're making their own product, they can become a little bit shy or a bit protective of their knowledge and they don't want to show themselves to not know things and I think I've always been someone to ask questions and to be curious rather than not know and you know defend my reputation or something so I think you know being curious and open-minded is really critical to this okay um two things one you said you're not on the spectrum oh I think I probably am yeah um, I think I show all the signs of it that's a very aspy um, approach to, to yeah. things. Um, yeah. And I think I, I'm married to your long lost daughter. Um, Selena is an obsessive note taker. We go out to a distillery launch or we go to a new distillery yeah. and she's she's the one writing in six pages. You know, there was a, a spider three meters up the left hand sort of corner of the, um, the distillery. And um, we yeah. actually went to Bathtub Jinko and sat through a distilling session. And that was a bit dangerous because it was always, oh, try this, try this, try this. And by about three o'clock in the afternoon, I was feeling very happy and I liked the world because we were there for the actually entire distilling session. Wow. Yeah. Um, so it nine, that could be very three. dangerous. We, uh, we have open days once a month at the distillery <coughs> and people will arrive. It runs for four hours from midday till 4 p.m. And people will arrive at 12 o'clock with the intention of just being there for 45 minutes or so. That's how long the the official visit lasts. We'll have a, a talk by our head distiller, my co-business owner, Phil, and he'll talk for about 15 minutes and explain the process of distillation um, and, you know, some of the aspects to production. And then I will do the sit-down tasting and we'll do a flight of four whiskies. So people are, would normally be finished but within about 45 minutes, but we will often have people end up staying for the entire afternoon and uh, we end up cracking open other barrels uh, and Phil in particular, my business partner, he loves sharing uh, what's going on in these casks. So we had a visitor recently who ended up tasting 15 different barrels while he was there. Fortunately, his wife had gone off shopping and she kept and collected him because he was not in a fit state to drive, I can tell you that. <laughs> yeah, um, I went to uh, my friend Mick in View Distillery, and Mick is like that. It's, I'll try this, try this, try this. And then he's got this massive gin collection. And after an hour of, I'll try this, try this, I'll look at him and, dude, he had to do an interview. Two, I'm driving. And three, we've got to go and pick up kids from the, from three o'clock onwards. And if yep. you keep on doing this, the last two are not happening. <laughs> yep, yep, absolutely. So um, now you wanted to know, you wanted to know a little bit about. <clears throat> how we came up with the idea of yeah. the distillery. Is Amber Lane <clears throat> so, at home or um, is it the lane outside the front of the still? Or So there is a, a, lane, a, a lane called Amber Lane near to the, the distillery. In the, it's, a, it's, a, it's probably half a kilometre up the road from us. And certainly that geographical name resonated for us. Um, but we're all about um, sharing the whiskey journey with people. And so um, the <laughs> lane is intended to be... Uh, a reference point to taking us somewhere and all of our labels sorry bear with me here all of our labels have that sort of street sign shape on them so we're taking you on a journey down in different directions exploring different avenues uh, for the whiskey um, but um, <clears throat> the the idea of the distillery came up 
so I had I had lots of people saying to me, uh, particularly at these professional events that I was hosting where I was talking about whiskey, they were saying to me, uh, you are so passionate about this and you know so much about it, why don't you make the whiskey? And of course I said at the time, well, I'm too busy, I've got a professional life here. Um, but um, when my friend Phil and I, we, we're both amateur astronomers yeah, uh, and we, yeah, mm. and so we were on a, a family holiday with our families up at Coonabarabran. We visited a small distillery up there called Blackgate and um, uh, it was a case of seeing with my own eyes how it was actually possible to run a simple distillery and I think often in life we might have ideas about things, but until we actually see how it's possible in practice to see, you know, in real terms, this is what it would look like, it it helped me move from aspirational to wanting to actualise. And so Phil and I had a conversation. He essentially caught my energy. He said to me, you know more about whiskey than that whiskey maker. I've got this enormous warehouse on my rural property why don't we make whiskey too? Why don't we do this? Uh, and so it was a fairly quick conversation. Um, I don't think that there's anything our wives could have said to dissuade us, even though formally we did ask permission um, before we, we we went down this path. And then we we uh, the conversation then turned to this very exciting process over the next 12 months where we, we travelled around Australia on these whirlwind weekend trips, visiting distilleries, and coming up with all of these novel ideas and we developed what we called our men's still cycle uh which was uh you know how many you know how often would we run this still and what the volumes would need to be in order to fill a certain number of barrels um and that and then we sort of settled on okay this is how large the still needs to be in our case a 3600 litre still um because we knew that that would fill comfortably for 200 litre ex bourbon casks. So that was that was the sort of the theory or three to 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 50 litre, you know, um, sherry casks. It, um, the asking mm. information, it reminds me of the um, advert in a South African paper, you know, for sale, brand new motorbike, be, you know, barely broken in, <clears throat> got all the biz bells and whistles. Apparently, do whatever the fuck you want from the wife didn't mean what I thought it meant. <clears throat> yes, indeed. Mm. Yeah, we've got to ask permission. Even if they even if it's their idea, we've got to go and ask permission. But yeah. your, your journey's like fully 90% of the dis gender stillers and with the sort of period I've spoken to. Um <clears throat> and even Cameron from Four Four Pillars, you know, yep. came out and goes, Oh, we we were drinking so much of it. Why not? And eventually the wife went off oh, for fuck's sake, go off and make it. Mm. You know, because if you know you you develop this encyclopedic knowledge, you go in and you if you're on the spectrum, you'll traumatize some poor psycho who isn't expecting the encyclopedia to walk in the front door and then then information dump on him, and mm. they just get to okay, it seems you know so much and you're so passionate, just fuck off and do it. <laughs> 